So let's go with the most important thing. Looking back now, it's been a few months. Did you have fun at Comic-Con with me or was it a bad experience? Do you want to know the truth? I do want to know the truth. Okay, so the way Comic-Con works, as you well know, right, is you go down some elevators or escalators or whatever it was to get to Hall H. And you also kept like away from the audience the whole time you went backstage. And so the last chance to go to the restroom is like a real maze. <laughs> like <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to say this story. Go on. I'm so no, sorry. No, no, no. And so it was like, I don't know why I did it, but someone gave me a big bottle of water and I drank the whole bottle. I don't know if it was nerves or something, but I drank the entire bottle. And I suddenly went on stage and I thought, I'll just go to pee just before we go on. And then we go to go on and, um, and there's no restroom anywhere. And it's like, three, two, one, Gareth Edwards, go! You know what I mean? And I sat there, I'm not joking, I'm really not joking. I sat there and I can't, I was like, I'm gonna pee myself. And we were there for what, it was an hour and a half? Yeah, it was 90 minutes. Yeah, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't stay up here. And I looked, I actually at one point, I actually looked to see what, what the audience could see of my trousers. <laughs> Cause, and there was like, you had a, you had a barrier thing up. You did, yes. Cause I was like, I think I'm just gonna pee myself. And like I wanted wanted to know how in, like career ending it, it would be if I did. So I do remember backstage you saying to me, uh, "I need to use the bathroom," and I was explaining to you you either need to go all the way into the convention yeah. thing or back upstairs. And I didn't realize the severity of it, but my, the highlight of everything though was uh, we went to play your footage from the creator, the sizzle, and uh, all all of you guys went to use the bathroom. I've never seen a whole panel go to the bathroom, but Louie ended up, I think he skipped it and sat in the front row to watch the footage, but I was on stage alone. Yeah, because all- I was gonna go when Justin's clip played of uh, Haunted Mansion, and I really wanted to pee then, and I was like, it's gonna look so rude if, I, if this clip plays and I just run off stage. And so like, I had to just take it, and then my clip came up and I was like, I can go now, right? But the thing is you dream of having a clip in Hall H, right? That's like your dream. And I was just at a urinal hearing it echo through the urinals as some guy was waiting with a Rogue One poster, <laughs> like awkwardly for me to sign it after I finished peeing. And it was like, this is, this, and it was like, this is so typical of filmmaking, you know, this is how it all plays out. Yeah, I, I think we all, I mean, everyone knew you were going to the bathroom, I think, or maybe not, I, it doesn't matter. So I want to, First of all, thank you for sharing the story because I wasn't sure if you were going to remind. Anyway, um, but one of the things that's amazing about this movie is the fact that you basically, uh, I think you radically changed how movies can be made and what might happen in the future with the way you shot this and the fact that you didn't design certain things before you went to location. Can you sort of talk about the, like, it's a pretty radical way you shot this. Yeah, because what, what, what normally happens is... You, you you know, you have this fantasy about a movie you want to make and you have all these designers and concept artists and you kind of figure out the world and it looks great and everything. And then you go, okay, how are we going to do this? And everyone's chasing that image. Okay, well, if you want this sort of shape, we're going to have to build that. And if you want this sort of environment, we can't go there. So we're going to, we'll do that against green screen. And, and it all sort of becomes like a $200 million movie and never feels as good. And so it was like, look, it, let's do this the other way around, right? Let's go make the film. So let's go to wherever in the world is the best location possible. Like if you have the crew small enough, then the cost of going any flying anywhere in the world with that group of people is cheaper than building a set. Like the second it's a bigger crew, now it's more expensive. And so let, let's just build a set, right? So it was like, get that down so we can go anywhere. And then, and then it's like, let's shoot the movie, let's edit it. And then when we know what's in the film, let's give those frames to our designer, James Klein and his team, and they, they can paint in the science fiction of, of exactly what's in the movie. So it's like a way more efficient thing. And it also then meant you can blend in whatever happy accident you had in the real world or crazy location you found just randomly. You can then like do, base your designs on like what, what the foreground looks like and what the midground looks like. And, and so it's, it's it's way better all around, and I wouldn't go back personally to the other way. Well, I was going to say, is this like a is this a uh, permanent change to the way you're going to make movies going forward? Yeah, I think I mean I think you could push it even further. Like I yeah definitely I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go back to the other way of making it's, it. It's it's so interesting because I've I've spoken to some people who basically it, it's it, it's crazy that the technology has reached this point where you can do this because in the past I was always. I guess it was under the assumption that with VFX, you, you, it was more, 
you couldn't do it. Yeah, and I think that is the assumption, even with VFX people. And so, we. So what happened was we we talked about this process with Industrial Light and Magic, and and they you know they obviously everyone's like nodding but thinking, oh my god, what is what are we getting ourselves into? And so we did a little test, and we didn't tell the studio, but they gave us some money uh, to go on a location scout. And so we went to Tokyo, Nepal, um, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and we shot. It's crazy. I know, we just wanted a holiday, right? <laughs> it's crazy. And I took a camera with me that had like a 1970s anamorphic lens and shot a little, I don't know what you call it, little taster, teaser, short nonsense thing. And then essentially basically tried to sort of prove this theory and do exactly what we do on the movie and give it to ILM, didn't have any tracking markers or dots or any data or any silver balls and all those things you see. Just give it them. That all they had was the footage and went, can you figure this out? And they went away and, you know, I wouldn't say it's magic because I met some of them recently. I think one of the guys was called Tim. I said I would shout, give him a shout out. Um, but through a lot of blood, sweat and tears, they got that, they managed to track all that stuff back into the computer and um, and pulled it off. And I think they were even surprised. And so they were like, so we we're like, can we do the movie like this then? And they were like, yeah, actually that was pretty, stuff that would normally take like a month to do, we were doing in like a couple of days or so. And like in terms of building cities, we didn't build the cities, we just projected them back onto footage and all this sort of stuff. And so we showed that to the studio and they had like, for the money we had done it for, they were like, oh, if you can make a movie like that, we're in. And so we got green lit basically. Are you planning, are you, uh, are you ready uh, for the lessons you're gonna be giving at like the DGA to other directors on how you pulled this off? No, <laughs> they don't want to hear from me. I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of people that want to learn uh, because it, it it's a lot cheaper to do it the way you do it did it than the other way. It's it's radical. Yeah, you know what was funny though is like when we were when I was prepping the film or not even prepping it, I was just kind of curious about certain technology and went to there's a, stu a studio in LA that does the whole virtual um, volume stuff and just as I was waiting, there was a poster on the wall. And it was basically the process of making a film. It was like a Venn diagram. I don't know what it was. It was like a diagram of this is how a movie is made. And it was, this is, you write the script, it does this, and these are all the different people. And, and I was looking at the poster going, okay, why have they got this poster on the wall? Like, it's so obvious. This is like filmmaking. What, what's this about? And the guy who came up to me and went, oh, I see you're looking at the poster. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, um, that's over a hundred years old. And I was like, what? And then you realize in over a century, we've not changed a thing. Do you know what I mean? Like the idea that something so technological, so digital now is a hundred year old process. Like it, it, it you know, it, there's got to be an easier way, a better way of doing this stuff. But it's like, it's some factory and it just doesn't want to change. You know what I mean? Let me switch to something completely different. I want to make sure I say the name right. Uh, Hank Corwin yes. is your editor. Yes. Uh, and like, talk a little bit about working with him because this is a radically different way of making a movie. So did you have like a longer cut? Like how did it work with the editing when you're doing VFX? I guess talk a little bit about working with him. So yeah, no, so Hank, so, so basically, so Joe Walker did the assembly who edited Dune and such amazing films. And uh, Hank and, and and Scott Morris basically were the two editors on the movie. And Hank, if you prior to the making this movie, if you had said to me, Gareth, what's the two best edited films in the history of cinema? I would have gone, I can't answer that question because I'm torn between JFK and The Tree of Life. And uh, they have an editor in common, which is Hank Corwin. And he's just kind of a bit of a genius. And so, um, we we essentially ended up in the situation where Hank was always like, he had done big movies, but he hadn't done like as with as many VFX shots as we had in this, and 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 so, but it didn't matter because all we did is we basically cut the movie, and one of the things they didn't have to worry about is everything. There was always something there representing what was going to be VFX. So in a lot, of, if I think it would have been a nightmare if we'd shot one of these films where it was green screen or blue screen. Sure. But because it was like, we really were in the jungles and the Himalayas. And so there's, even if there wasn't the sci-fi temple, there was a temple. And so you could just cut this like a, a contemporary film 
And so, and what they were so good at is like Hank, what I love about him, he does many, many things, but um, he's very left field with his thinking. I'm usually the person with a rope trying to drag everyone else off a cliff and everyone else is going, no, Gareth, no, you know what I mean? And I'm like, come on, let's get to the edge. And they're like, we're going to die, <laughs> right? Hank, Hank lives, he's got a house at the bottom of the canyon. Like he's off, he's off the cliff already. He's pulling me and... I'm going, no, Hank, no, you know, like, and so it's like really refreshing to be in a situation where someone is challenging you creatively and like making you way out of your comfort zone. And, and so that was beautiful. And then, um, and then there was only a few times, I remember quite a few conversations, but it wasn't like difficult, but I would go away and make selects because obviously it's like, okay, I would, you know, you, is a, is one of these jet copter things, is it coming in from the left or the right or four? And I'd be like, I don't know. I just grabbed a load of footage and, and let's figure it out. So I would sit and try and figure out what I wanted to happen and maybe drag some silly little font across the screen to represent where some CG, you know, vehicle might be. And then we would sit and watch like eight or nine selects and talk about them. And, and you always want feedback. You always want you always want someone to like agree with you, you know what I mean? And and so we we had this really nice relationship between the three of us where um, we kept each other, like we pushed each other, but kept kept each other in check. And and there was, we, it was to them, I would think they would say that it was like doing a normal film in terms of the way they cut it. But I know they really enjoyed sitting in on the VFX um, conversations so when we talked to ILM and we did all those zooms and stuff they would be listening in because they just were curious about how it all works but it didn't you didn't need to have like a PhD in visual effects to cut this movie it was because it was all there there was very we didn't do green screen and things like that so it was all quite straightforward I butchered the, the original question so I'll ask this one I like asking this of every director did you have a much longer cut is it like uh like did you have a cut that you were like it's two and a half hours I don't know how it's getting down. Yeah, the first cut was just under five hours. So. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> the assembly. I don't generally hear assembly cuts being five hours. It was it was under five hours. Um, it was, yeah. So Joe, Joe Walker and Yob had done this cut of the movie whilst I was shooting. <laughs> and... And then I, and then they had to go and do June two, or, or Joe went to do June two, and and so I went around Hank's house, and we basically basically hit play on this like just under five hour cut, and and I always expect when I watch an assembly to want to kill myself, you know what I mean? Because basically you see you see all the things you did wrong, you see what's not working. It's the worst version of the film ever is the assembly, and hopefully you know you just sure. you know that's just the way it works, right? And so, um, but it was this really, they did this amazing feat of like putting everything together really well. And, and so, but that implies there's this version of the film with all this stuff in it you could sit and watch. And I think that's just not true. It's, we got it down. Like we always wanted, I always wanted to make a two hour movie. Star Wars is pretty much that. And it's p like pacing wise is like spot on. And so, I didn't want to like outstay my welcome and do like a long film. And and I think it was, there's a film critic in the UK who said Stanley Kubrick managed to tell a story from the dawn of mankind until we evolve into being a God in two hours, 10 minutes. So if you take longer telling your story, you're just not trying hard enough. And I've always like took that to heart. Like it feels like they kind of got a point. Um, and so, it was really a game of Jenga, like what can we remove from the film and it not fall to pieces? Um, and and it was just trial and error over like, basically until the, the clock ran out and we got there, I hopes. But it was, um, it's a fascinating experience because you show people the movie and they, uh, we had a two hour 15 version of the movie, which we all really loved. We played it to a bunch of people. Everyone disagreed like about what they thought was right and wrong. And then the, pe the people who ran the test screening said, when that happens, it tends to mean it's too long. So we cut 15 minutes out and got it down to two hours, played it again, and it did way, way better. And there was no more disagreements. And it was a strange lesson in how can you take things out we love and it's still, and then it'd be better. You know, it didn't make sense, but apparently that's what happened. So.
I have so many follow-ups, but I have to go. I'm just going to say, I hope on the Blu-ray, the eventual Blu-ray, you include a bunch of deleted scenes or whatever, because I would love to see more in this world. Oh, no. Okay, well, yeah, point taken. We'll see what happens. <laughs> exactly. On that note, uh, good luck with your Korea press conference, and thank you for everything. Thank you. No, thank you.